Good morning, good morning church. Shalom, good morning, you're here with me this morning. Those of you who are online, uh, shalom to you as well. If you are there, brother, you just type in the chat right now, shalom, so that I know you are there and you are engaging with us uh, this morning. So let's be participants and not be spectators this morning. Amen. So very glad to be bringing the Word of God to you this morning, to all of us. Um, this week, Okay, we will be taking a break from our usual sermon series on family and sexuality. As you have heard Pastor Victor talk, say, this is a very special day in the church calendar, right? Because we are commemorating Pentecost Sunday. And you know, it feels like a normal Sunday to many of us, isn't it? Just a normal Sunday, you wake up and you come to church again, just as usual. But I want you to know, that 2,000 years ago, just 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, this day, all right, this very day was anything but ordinary. Anything but ordinary. In fact, it was a historic day. A day that marked a major turning point in the history of mankind. And I'm not exaggerating when I said that because on that very day, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the believers and on the church. You see, after Jesus' death, uh, the disciples, they were scattered, right? And they were disillusioned. And suddenly, Jesus rose again from the dead and gave them this very humongous mission that they are to fulfill. And we all know what that is. That is to make disciples of all nations. And so, you know, having received that, that humongous mission, you know, they knew they had unimaginable obstacles uh, that were facing them. And they must have felt really, really overwhelmed. And they must be thinking, you know, uh, how, how do we even begin to do that? Where do I even start to fulfill this very huge, huge mission that God has given to us? And that was the time when the day of Pentecost arrived. And at that time, the Holy Spirit came and the disciples were empowered. They were transformed and they were just sent forth into the nations to do the work that God has given to them. And because of that, the church was birthed on that day. And the church was birthed as the reconstituted divine human family of God. Okay, you can refer to last year's Pentecost sermon on 23rd May to refresh your memory. It was part of our series uh, on the supernatural realm part two. Okay, and you can see the QR code on the screen. Uh, you can scan the QR code and rewatch it if you have forgotten. But basically in that series, we mentioned that a divine rebellion took place. Okay, do you remember that? Your divine rebellion took place at Babel, recorded in Genesis chapter 11. And that resulted in God disinheriting the nations. Right? And then when the Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit came, it reversed the negative effects of Babel. And where the scattered people of God were regathered and they were empowered to fulfill God's Edenic vision. And that is to bring the gospel message of salvation to the disinherited nations of the world. Now this is important for all of us today because in the same way, right, you and I, we still have the same mission and we also need that same empowerment that they had. And so we too need the Pentecost experience, not once or twice, but daily. Amen? And so the big idea for today's message is that we need the Pentecost experience daily to fulfill God's mission. Why don't you tell your neighbour right now, you need the Pentecost experience. Tell your neighbour right now. Yes, we need it to fulfill God's mission. And by Pentecost, I mean the event in Acts chapter 2 where the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what is the Pentecost experience. And there are two aspects that I want to highlight this morning, very important for all of us, that firstly, we need to experience the Pentecostal promise. Pentecostal promise. And secondly, we need to experience the Pentecostal presence. 
So the first thing, we're going to go right into it right now. The early church experience was the fulfillment of the Pentecostal promise. Those of you who are online, why don't you just type in the chat right now, promise. All right, there is a Pentecostal promise that the early church experienced. You see, the day of Pentecost didn't come by accident. Okay, it's not an afterthought. It's not like, you know, it was just something that came by accident. Uh, it was intentional. It was carefully thought out and orchestrated by God centuries before it even happened. Did you know that? You see that the prophet Joel prophesied in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 30. And this is what the prophet Joel said, And it shall come to pass afterward that... I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Everybody say, I will. Yes, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Verse 29, even on the male and female servants, in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And verse 30, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. You see, the repeated statement, I will, I will, I will, it tells us that God is determined to do it. He is determined. And therefore, the Pentecost experience that they went through, the disciples went through, was not from men, but from God. It's from God. And the, pen, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was really an essential part of God's redemptive plan. It was an essential part of it. It's not good to have. It's not like an optional add-on uh, of characteristics, you know, that, that he gave. It was essential. And it's for everyone, right? In the passage that we just read earlier, it's very clear. The outpouring of the Spirit is for all flesh. All young and old, men and women, rich and poor, for all. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was so critical, in fact, that Jesus himself affirmed that prophecy. And it was among his last words before his ascension. And we read that in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Let's read along, okay? Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says, And while staying with them, he ordered them, the disciples, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And in verse 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So this means that the baptism in the Holy Spirit was and is mission critical for the church. It's mission critical. It wasn't going to be easy witnessing for Jesus, right? You and I know that. That's why they needed the Pentecost experience. And so gracious, first God said, I will, I will, I will, I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders and signs. And then Jesus said, you will receive power. You will be baptized in the Spirit. And so it is certain, it's a promise. It is true and that is our hope. Amen? It's our hope because God has promised and Jesus has affirmed it. He desires to do it. It's an essential part of His plan to do it. And He will do it. That is the Pentecost promise. And sure enough, we see the fulfillment of that promise in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. All right, it's a very famous account. Let's read it together again because it's powerful. Verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Wow! 
It's like heaven suddenly broke out on earth, right? The floodgates suddenly opened and the Spirit was poured out on the people just like it was prophesied by Joel and our Lord Jesus. And again, we see that all those seeking were filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to repeat that. All were filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? It's not just for, for long-time Christians or for, just for pastors, not just for you know, those who are spiritually you know, in the elite group. You know? It's for all. Amen? Amen. It's for all. And this promise also you know, was not just for the disciples then in the early church. Because we have seen the outpouring of the Spirit on countless individuals and groups since then. And uh, you know, it's very well documented in history that there were many similar moves of God in history. From you know, the Martin Luther Reformation to the Great Awakenings in America to the revivals in England. And especially significant for us was the Azusa Street Revival that took place in 1906. Okay, many of you may have heard of this. Some of you may, may not have. But let me try to summarize this very remarkable event in history. It's really an awesome event that took place in 1906. All right, so, you know, so here's some uh, history lesson for all of us this morning, okay? Charles Parham, this guy called Charles Parham, was an evangelist, pastor evangelist, and uh, he established a Bible school in Topeka, Kansas in 1898, all right? And he was the first to teach that the baptism in the Holy Spirit, okay, uh, was evidenced by the speaking in tongues. He was the first to teach that. Okay, uh, to his students, and, but he never experienced it personally. And one of his students was named William Seymour. All right, William Seymour, he was an African-American. Uh, he was the son of former slaves. Uh, he was short uh, and he was blind in one eye. Okay, he was not you know, a very eloquent, very expressive kind of preacher. In fact, there was really nothing very impressive about him at all. But his heart was set on fire with the teachings about tongues by Parham. And so after completing his studies, uh, Seymour was invited to pastor a church in Los Angeles. And uh, because the people there, they were really uh, excited, they were really eager to hear about the teachings about speaking in tongues as the evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so in early 1906, Seymour preached his first sermon uh, in LA um, and on the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the one that we just read earlier. And some of them, you know, they were re very receptive to his teachings, but he himself hadn't experienced speaking in tongues yet. He himself hadn't, but he was teaching about it. And then on 6 April 1906, Seymour prayed for a certain Mr. Lee, and he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he spoke in tongues. And so Seymour was really, really excited. He rushed back to the house where, you know, some of the believers were gathered and he shared the news with them. And when he shared the news with them, you know, their faith rose. And, and at, at that point, Seymour and seven others fell to the ground and they began to speak in tongues. Wow, the, the Spirit was poured out on them. They fell to the floor. They started speaking in tongues. And, you know, the word spread quickly about this phenomenon that took place. And a lot of people began to gather to listen to his teachings and they want to uh, uh, experience the speaking in tongues and baptism in the Holy Spirit. And the crowds grew and grew. It grew so large that they had to search for a much bigger place to hold their meetings. And just like that, they began their meetings at 312 Azusa Street. All right, that's the address. 312 Azusa Street. Uh, maybe similar to our 355 Tangling Road. <laughs> Hopefully, you know. Yes, 312 Azusa Street. Unaware that this name would go down in history as the birthplace of a mighty revival. You know, crowds throng the building seeking to hear the gospel message and experience the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And imagine this, for three years, they held three services a day, 
All right, not a week, three services a day for seven days a week for three years. It continued and continued. Revival broke out in that place. Some services ran for 10 to 12 hours. <laughs> okay, so tonight the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit comes, maybe we'll be here for 10 to 12 hours. And some services even ran continuously for, for days, you know, days and nights. And at that time, some churches came together and formed the Assemblies of God which became one of the biggest Pentecostal denominations in the world. And as of 2020, what started there with just a few believers, now there are 635 million Pentecostal and Charismatic believers across the globe. Hallelujah. Can we give the Lord a mighty hand of praise? Hallelujah. That's what we at Grace Assembly are a part of today. Those of you who didn't know that, we are called Grace Assembly of God. We are part of this great movement of the Spirit. And so, Gracious, this is the point. The Azusa Street Revival was a continuation of the fulfillment of the Pentecostal promise made many, many centuries ago. It was a continuation of that fulfillment and it continues even up to today. Up to today. And so those of you who have not yet been baptized in the Spirit, those of you who need to continue to be filled in the Spirit, I want you to know that the Pentecostal promise is not optional, but it's an essential part of God's plan. And it's essential for us today if we are to fulfill God's mission. It's essential for us. And that promise is for us today. And so what exactly was so impactful about the outpouring of the Spirit? What was so impactful about it? It was the manifestation of the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. And that's why you need to experience the Pentecostal presence as well. So those of you who are online, why don't you type in the chat, presence. Yes, we need that Pentecostal presence. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4 that we read earlier, right? Remember? The sound of the wind and the tongues of fire that came, right? And these were physical manifestations of the presence of God. But it didn't just stop there, nor was it just contained within that one place or that moment. The disciples, they were baptized in the Spirit and spoke in tongues. So to experience the Pentecostal presence, there are three things. The first thing you need is to be completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Be completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. You see, the disciples already had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In John 20 verse 22, it said that, you know, that uh, Jesus breathed on them and told them, receive the Holy Spirit. So they already have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but they had not experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know, it is clear in the book of Acts that these are two separate experiences. Okay? Two separate experiences. We see also that in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, we read earlier as well. I want to re-emphasize this again. For John baptized with water... That's one experience. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay? So these are two experiences. Water baptism symbolizes repentance unto God and it's a public declaration of your faith in Jesus Christ. And when you get saved through faith in Christ, the Spirit comes and lives in you. Spirit baptism, on the other hand, is about being completely surrendered to the Spirit. Completely. All right, so that He fills your life to the extent that He's in control of your life and He's the Lord of your life. So Jesus is saying, you need to be baptized in water, but you also need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit if you are to be my witnesses. You need that. And the Greek word for baptize is baptizo. All right? And this word means to immerse. To immerse. So you get fully immersed in the spirit like cloth being dipped in dye. Okay, you know dye, the color dye. The cloth, when you take a piece of cloth and you dip it in a bucket of dye, you imagine 
the cloth will then take on all the characteristics of the dye, isn't it? It takes on the color, the appearance. It takes on maybe the smell, the texture of the dye. And so similarly, you know, when you get baptized, when you get immersed in the Spirit, you take on all the characteristics of the Spirit. Amen? And if you think of the, the cloth in the dye, when it's dipped in, you see that the cloth is in the dye, right? And the dye is in the cloth, right? So we are in the Spirit and the Spirit is in us. So when you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit. But when you get baptized in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has you. It, he has you. You are totally surrendered to the Spirit and He has full control of your life. That is being completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And it's the difference between waddling, you know, in ankle deep water versus being completely swept away by huge ocean waves. Imagine the difference, okay? Some of you may have gone surfing before. You know what I mean. When you are swept away by the huge waves, that's the difference. When you are in the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, you are swept away by the presence of God, by the Holy Spirit. So how do you know you have been baptized in the Spirit? How do you know that? The initial sign and evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. That is the initial sign of being baptized in the Spirit. You see that repeatedly in the book of Acts. You know, it, it kept repeating, they were filled with the Spirit and spoke in tongues. They were filled in the Spirit and spoke in tongues. The tongues that you hear us speak in our services from time to time is one where the Spirit prays through us. All right? And we are speaking to God in a language which we don't understand. Okay? We simply speak by faith and the Bible says that it builds up our inner man. It builds you up. Speaking in tongues strengthens us and encourages us in a supernatural way. And I know it can feel strange speaking in an unknown language. But that is part of surrendering completely to the Holy Spirit. You get swept away by the waves of the Spirit and you let Him take control and you begin to pray in perfect alignment to God's will. It's wonderful. And later, at the end of the service, I will give you an opportunity to be baptized in the Spirit. We're going to pray with you and we're going to guide you on how to receive the gift of speaking in tongues. All right? So get ready to completely surrender to the Holy Spirit. Tell your neighbor right now, get ready. Get ready, yes. We're going to do that this morning and I believe that the Lord is going to move among us. So speaking in tongues is just one of the many manifestations of the presence of God. If you read the book of Acts, the disciples also manifested God's presence through miracles of healing, through raising of dead people, through their boldness in preaching the gospel, through their unity in the church, many different ways and other signs and wonders that God manifests His presence among His people. In other words, they became carriers of God's presence everywhere they went. And this tells us that once you are completely surrendered to the Spirit, you will be carriers of God's presence. And that's the second thing we need to be. Okay, we need to be carriers of God's presence. You know, God is everywhere, right? We all know that. God is omnipresent. But what happened at Acts 2? What happened in 1906? You see, at that point, God manifested Himself in a greater measure and with greater intensity. And I want you to know that it also happened in Azusa Street in 1906. All right? It's a very well-documented fact that marvelous, very you know, supernatural healings and miracles took place. And it was said that no one could possibly record all the miracles that occurred there. Someone said, you know, Dr. Lewis Morgan also recorded that blinded eyes being opened Death being able to hear, mute being able to speak, the lame made to walk, and the dead raised to life again. Such reports are commonplace among these early Pentecostal believers. 
And it was also said that the power of God could be felt around Azusa Street, you know, not just within the building, but all around Azusa Street, outside the building. The holiness of God was manifested in an amazing, amazing way. And one person actually said that, you know, within two blocks of that building, all right, he had to stop more than once. And, you know, he had to pray for the strength to go nearer. And, you know, he had to pray and he had to get right with God before he even dared to walk even closer to that building. Many curious, you know, onlookers, passers by would, would pop by, they would hear the gospel message, they would experience the power of God, and they would get saved. Another account said that ministries, many ministries arose during that time uh, from the revival. It served the poor women, they served the alcoholics, the drug addicts, the prostitutes, and others marginalized by society. And these missions often offered not only spiritual help, but also material help. Eight. Amazing that God was manifesting Himself in all these different ways. And a great number of believers, newly baptized in the Spirit, they went to literally the ends of the earth as missionaries. All right? From India to China to Egypt to Africa uh, to Scandinavia to Ireland, all over the world, they began to go as missionaries. Hallelujah. Can God do it again? today. Can God do it again today, Gracians? Yes, He can. Yes, He can do it again today. And He can do it through us, through you and me. And we need to be carriers of God's manifested presence everywhere we go. And one of the ways that we can do that is through spiritual gifts, right? Spiritual gifts. We read earlier in Joel's prophecy, that when God pours out His Spirit, what did He say? People will prophesy, right? People will dream dreams. They will see visions. There will be wonders and signs taking place all over. And that is how God wants to manifest Himself. And He does it through us, through you and me. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts especially that you may prophesy. Pursue love. God can become real to people around you, can manifest Himself by the way you love them. That's why Paul said, pursue love. They can also encounter God as you prophesy, as you bring a word of knowledge, as you pray for their healing, as you exercise your spiritual gifts that God has given to you. Think and imagine of what God can through, do through us if each of us became carriers of God's manifested presence in our homes, our offices, our neighborhoods, our hawker centers. Think of what God can through, do through you and I. And so the third thing that we need in order to experience Pentecostal presence, the first thing is we need to be completely surrendered, right? To the Holy Spirit. Second thing is we need to be carriers, be carriers of God's presence. And the third thing right now is that we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Now the key word there is continually, friends. And so those of you online, why don't you type in the chat right now, continually. We need to be continually filled. It's not a once-off experience, you may feel good when you come today, but it's not a once-off experience. It's a daily experience that we need to have. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that Greek word for fill, be filled, it means to be constantly, continually filled. It's in a continuous tense. It's like how a fountain, you know, has an unceasing flow of water. You imagine a fountain. The water is flowing continually. It's brimming over with, with life-giving water. It, it doesn't stop. It just continues on and on and on. And those who have already experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you need to hear this, all right? Are you constantly, 
overflowing with life of the Holy Spirit inside you Con continually? Is your heart still red hot, passionate and on fire for Jesus like you once were? Or have you lost the hunger for the things of God? Or are you in a season of spiritual dryness running on empty? I know the cares of life can easily, you know, suck us dry. You know, the daily grind of work and responsibilities. You know, sometimes we become uh, easily irritated. We are less patient with the people around us. You know, we, lack, we know that we lack the capacity to love there's a lack of joy in our lives and there's a lack of spiritual vitality. But I want you to know that biblically, the picture of a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit is one of overflowing and abundance of life. Overflowing. In John chapter 7, this is what Jesus said. In John chapter 7, verse 37. Okay, follow along with me. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He declares that. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And what is this river of living water? In verse 39, he says, Now this is said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So the infilling of the Spirit would be like rivers of living water flowing from your heart and flowing from your life. It's overflowing. It's full of vitality. It's life-giving. That is what the Holy Spirit would do in you and I. And so when you're empty, when you're dry, when you're thirsty, come, Jesus said, come to me and drink of this living water. Thirst for this living water because all other kinds of water will leave you unsatisfied. Only this living water that Jesus gives, the Holy Spirit will satisfy you and cause you to live the overflowing and abundance of life. Hallelujah. So how, you know, you, then you ask me, Pastor, how do I be continually filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm going to give you three very practical ways that you can be continually filled with the Spirit. Okay, three ways. First, you need to pray in the Spirit daily. Pray in the Spirit daily. That means speaking in tongues, all right? You have been given the wonderful gift of speaking in tongues. You must use it daily. All right. So, you know, when you do that, you are actually edifying yourself. You are strengthening, you are building yourself up. The Holy Spirit will do that in you. And when you don't know what to pray for, when you speak in tongues, okay, God will lead you how to pray. And you can do it in your work. You can do it uh, uh, you know, in between tasks. You can do it in, you know, in the shower, in the toilet, and where you exercise, anytime and anywhere. You can pray in the Spirit. Okay? And the second thing that you, need to, you can do is to talk to the Spirit. All right? Not just praying in tongues, but talk to the Spirit daily. Because the Holy Spirit is part of the triune uh, Godhead, all right? You can speak to Him just like you speak to the Father and just like you speak to Jesus, all right? You can speak to the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that He's your counsellor, He's your comforter, and He's the one who will come along you to cheer you on, to help you, and to be your companion. You can seek Him for guidance and you can talk to Him daily. Welcome His presence with you. Right? You can do that. Welcome Him and His Lordship into your life and ask Him to fill you continually. Amen. You can talk to the Spirit. Why don't all of us right now, let's take our hand and put it on our hearts right now. Let's do it together. Take your hand, put it on your hearts right now. And even those online. And why don't you just say this together with me. Holy Spirit, You are welcome in this place. Close your eyes and say it right now. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Amen. Yes, you can talk to the Holy Spirit like that daily. All right? And the last thing I want to share with all of us is that you need to obey the Spirit daily. 
Obey the Spirit. Respond to Him. As you talk to Him, you take time to listen to Him, uh, He will speak to you. And when He speaks, you need to respond to Him. You need to obey Him. And He will remind you of Jesus' teachings. He will alert you when you sin. He will prompt you to reach out to somebody. And He will remind you that God loves you. He will remind you of that. You know, as a teenager, uh, I had um, very low self-esteem, right? And uh, I was bullied in school, and I, I always felt inferior to my peers. But you know, when I first encountered the Holy Spirit at probably age 14 or 15, things started to change. You know, many times when I entered the worship service and I was worshipping, I would be weeping, I would be crying because, you know, I just felt God's love wrapping around me. His, his embrace will come around me time and time again. I'll be weeping in service. And, and, you know, that was such an important part of my teenage years, you know, where I encountered the Holy Spirit and He reminded me that I am His child, that I am loved by Him, and that I am not an orphan. And that was formative for me, so critical in making me who I am today. And so, you know, as I prepare this sermon, I just sense that there are some of you here, even those who are online, some of you, you also need to know that God loves you. And the Holy Spirit will do that in you. You need to know and hear from the Holy Spirit that you are not an orphan. You are not an orphan. You are loved by God. You are His child. And so, gracious, we need to pray in the Spirit, talk to the Spirit, and obey the Spirit. And I assure you that you will begin to experience that overflowing abundance of life in the Spirit. Hallelujah. So church, we have a glorious mission to fulfill. Amen. We have. And that's why we need the Pentecost experience daily. If we are to fulfill that mission, we need it. We need the Pentecostal promise. It's been promised. God is determined. He said, I will, I will, I will pour out my Spirit and you will be filled with the Spirit. It's a promise and it's essential for you and I. And we also need the Pentecostal presence. The presence of God to be manifested in our lives. We can be carriers of God's presence. We can be completely surrendered to the Spirit. And we can be, you know, just, uh, we can be carriers of His presence. So gracious, come this morning. I want to give all of us a chance to respond to the Lord right now. It demands a response from all of us. And the two groups of people I want to address, the first group are those of you who are feeling spiritually dry. Even spiritually dead, perhaps, you know, you've already experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but you have not been continually filled. Perhaps you know you have lost that spiritual vitality and fervor for the Lord. You know that. And I know that how it feels like. I know. Recently, I've been tired and, you know, sometimes I do feel like I'm running on the empty. There's no hunger for the Word of God. You know what I mean? There's no desire to pray. And some of us know that. And something is missing in our lives. You need to be filled with the Spirit daily. You need to be revived by the rivers of living water. And right now, God can breathe life into your soul again. And those dry bones will come to life. And if that is you, you want to respond to the Lord, why don't you just raise your hand to the Lord and say, God, I need to be continually filled with the Spirit. Why don't you raise your hand and respond to the Lord right now, all over this place, yes. Hands are going up all over, yes. Just respond to the Lord and say, God, I need to be continually filled with the Spirit. I need you, Lord, the rivers of living water. I need you, Lord. Thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You may put your hands down. The second group of you that I want to address this morning are those who have never been baptized in the Spirit. I want you to know that the Pentecostal promise is for you too, it's for all. Don't worry about the how. If you desire it, you come. You respond to the Lord and we will guide you along. It's a very simple process. And so if that is you, you want to experience, be baptized in the Spirit and to speak in tongues, why don't you raise your hand to the Lord right now? Just between you and God. 
just between you and God, you say, yes, thank you. Come on, just respond to the Lord right now. Thank you. Yes, I see those hands. Come on, raise your hands and respond to the Lord right now. Even those in the gallery, those of you at home, respond to the Lord in your own way and say, God, I want to be filled with the Spirit this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you. You may put your hands down. I want to just invite all of us to stand right now. We're going to go into a time of just, just being in God's presence. Everyone, I want, to, I want you to listen carefully. I have some instructions for all of us. Those of you who want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, you want to speak in tongues for the first time, I want you to come to the altar. We have pastors here who will be praying with you. I want you to come to my right and your left side, okay? Those of you who want to be uh, baptized in the Spirit and speak in tongues for the first time, come to this side of the altar, your left side, okay? And those of you who want to receive the infilling, continue to be filled, I want to invite you to come as well. Come to the right side of the altar, okay? As we sing this song, why don't you all just make your way forward right now? Come, Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Yes, come, come. Fall afresh don't be shy. on me. The Lord is going to meet you right here. And fill me oh, with you, your power. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And satisfy my needs only. right just hold on a minute okay we are going to give you some instructions okay some simple instructions to follow let me pray for this group of people first all right those of you here you want to be continually filled with the spirit why don't you just raise your hand to the lord right now let the lord do it in your life you know if the lord wants to touch you you may fall under the power you may laugh you may cry just allow the lord to do that father i just ask that god you will pour out your spirit once again fill your people oh god we invite you right now fill your people once again Lord Lord let the spiritual dry or those who are dry in the spirit begin to be refreshed be refreshed by the streams of living water in the name of Jesus Father you come and you touch each one you begin to break every bondage upon their life and you begin to set them free Lord in the name of Jesus hallelujah hallelujah Thank you, Lord. Just worship the Lord, alright? All of you here, just continue to worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And those of you who are here, okay, uh, just, I just want you to look at me for a moment. It's a very simple process, okay? I want you to relax, okay? Do not, you do not need to strive. You do not need to ask, well, you need to be very stressed about it. Relax, okay? Focus on the Lord. Focus on Jesus. Okay, He has done the work and He's the one who will baptize you, who will fill you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so just worship Him. Keep your eyes focused on Him. That's the first thing. Relax. The second thing you need to do is to receive. Okay, receive it like a gift. Right? It's not something you need to work for. Just receive it and thank Him for it by faith. Do it by faith. Just like how you receive salvation. Receive it by faith. The Holy Spirit, okay, and ask the Lord to fill you, to baptize you in the Spirit. And the third thing, very important thing that you need to do 
is you need to respond. Okay? You need to say something. You need to open up your mouth. Say something. Say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And, and, and maybe a syllabus, one syllable will come to your mind. It could be just a ma 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 syllable or a la 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 syllable. Just speak it out. Alright? Speak it out boldly in faith. And I'm going to pray for you right now. And uh, there'll be pastors here who will guide you along as well. Come on, gracious, why don't you raise your hands and lift your hands towards this group of people and begin to pray for them. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just invite you right now. Lord, we desire you. The Pentecostal promise, oh God. Lord, you come and fill your people. You come and baptize your people in the Holy Spirit like you did in Acts chapter 2, oh God. Let the tongues of fire fall upon your people, God, this morning. Fall upon your people, Father. And Lord, open up their tongues, oh God, to speak. Speak, oh God, in that heavenly language right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we invite you. Come and baptize your people in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Begin to open up your mouth. Begin to speak right now. Begin to speak right now. Begin to praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord. Oh, shut up, Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Fall afresh on me. Fall afresh on me. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your power. Fill us, O God. Fill us again, Lord. Oh, satisfy. Oh, shit.
fall fresh on me fall fresh on me fall fresh on me oh god fall fresh on us come on wherever you are right now if you know how to speak in tongues you begin to speak in tongues right now where you are Oh, Spirit of God, let revival come in our hearts right now. Come on, some of you, you are feeling the revival in your hearts right now. Come on, just begin to press in, press in, press in right now. You're feeling the Spirit of God prompting you to go deeper. Jump in right now, jump in right now.
presence of God is here among us right now. We're going to linger for uh, just a few more moments. Uh, among the pastors, some feel led that perhaps there are some of you here who need a healing touch from God. We don't want to, to, to let this go by. We don't, don't want to let the presence of God just come and leave. But we just, you know, those of you who need a healing touch from the Lord, why don't you just raise your hand to Him right now? I believe that the power of God is present right here and to heal us and to touch us, to do wonders and signs and miracles like He did before. It's a promise. So raise your hand to the Lord right now. Thank you, Lord. You may be standing in proxy for someone you know at home. I know many Gracians, parents are suffering from cancer and I'm going to be interceding for them right now. And those of you who know such people as well, you raise your hand to the Lord as well. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we come before, Lord, the Almighty God, the throne of grace, O oh Lord. God, you are the God who heals, O oh Lord. You are the God of signs and wonders and miracles, yes, O oh Father. Yes. Lord, you see all the hands raised, Lord. You know every sick person, Lord, in this place, as well as those that we, are, we know at home, those who are close to us. Father, we uphold them before you right now. And we ask God, you release your power. Release your power, your healing, O oh God, your wholeness, O oh Father, your, your, your wonderful healing hand to stretch out right now in the name of Jesus. And we declare you are healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, O oh God. Every cancer got to go. Every heart disease got to go. Every stroke got to go. Every paralysis got to leave in the name of Jesus. Every, every injured leg, a fractured leg, a fractured foot or hand, you be healed in the name of Jesus. Right now, every disease must bow down to the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we receive it right now and we give you thanks. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's Come give on, the Lord give praise. Hallelujah.